Sarah Patiglia. I'm with the research division at ARB. And we're going to go ahead and get started um, with the seminar today. Uh, so just a couple of things. Um, the, if you're listening online, then you probably are already aware that um, the PowerPoint presentation for the um, seminar is, uh, it should be loaded on the website already. Uh, if it's not, it will be soon. Um, you can also find the final report on the website for this project. As, and the recorded webcast will be uploaded to that page as well after the presentation. Um, and then if you're listening on the web and you want to um, ask a question, you can just email it to Sierra RM, all one word, at calepa.ca.gov. But that is also on the website, so you should um, see that there. Uh, and then I also wanted to just uh, give a shameless plug for signing up for the research divisions listserv, which is on our website. And um, if you sign up for the listserv, you'll get announcements about all the research seminars that we have, um, solicitations that go out, requests for research concepts from the public, um, et cetera. Lots of really exciting information. <laughs> um, but yeah, we're here today to uh, um, have uh, Marshall and Arun present their results from their study uh, on um, life cycle analyses for renewable hydrogen. Uh, Marshall Miller uh, is a senior development engineer at UC Davis's um, Institute of Transportation Studies, also known as ITS. Um, and uh, his work is focused on understanding the implications of specific vehicle and fuel technologies, including fuel cells, batteries, hydrogen, and biofuels. And we also have Arun Raju, who is an, an assistant research engineer at UC Riverside Center for Environmental Research and Technology, also known as CSERT. Um, and he's also currently the director of the Center for Hydrogen natural gas, um, and his research focuses on renewable fuels, um, energy systems analysis, including techno-economic and life cycle analyses, CO2 utilization, and optimization of energy conversion pathways. So with that, I'll um, let you guys take over. Okay, I'm Marshall Miller. Uh, first of all, thank you, Sarah. I'm Marshall Miller from UC Davis, uh, and I'll be talking along with uh, Dr. Raju from uh, UC Riverside. The project is the development of life cycle data for hydrogen fuel production and delivery. Uh, this project is broken into actually three tasks. Uh, the first set of tasks uh, center around life cycle analysis. Um, First, we identify renewable hydrogen production pathways that are anticipated to be available in the short, medium, and long term, long term being about 20 years. Uh, then a technological assessment uh, will essentially perform a life cycle analysis to understand the energy usage and greenhouse gas emissions for those pathways. And finally, the, there is a economic assessment that estimates the cost for those pathways and tries to understand the most cost effective options. Uh, the second set of tasks are uh, related in that they're hydrogen, uh, focused on hydrogen, but they're a little different than an LCA analysis. Uh, the first part of that is leveraging the natural gas infrastructure, uh, the idea being that in the early period, uh, fuel cell vehicles may not create a large demand for hydrogen, um, and uh, so there may not be hydrogen uh, pipelines and so on. So one of the questions is if you don't have local hydrogen produced at a fueling station and you need to get it uh, distributed uh, from a uh, source far away, would you use trucking or maybe could you use the natural gas infrastructure? So uh, we looked at that. Another project task is to understand potential markets for hydrogen. In the early days, again, the demand for hydrogen from fuel cell vehicles is likely to be small. Um, so the question is, are there other potential hydrogen markets, either off-road or non-transportation, uh, that could increase the overall hydrogen demand? Uh, and then we wanted to estimate that demand and also to identify barriers to commercialization 
and some strategies to overcome those barriers. Okay, so at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Dr. Raju to talk about the LCA analysis. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Marshall, and thank you, Sarah. Um, so, as Marshall mentioned, the project has uh, a number of related but distinct tasks. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me. So, the tasks that we worked on are the techno-economic assessment and also a, an evaluation of technology availability. So, essentially looking at uh, different approaches to making renewable hydrogen and which pathways are expected to be uh, available in the near term, mid term, and long term. So that's the first uh, topic I'm going to talk about, and then I'll go over the life cycle assessment. Uh, we used the California Greek model to do the analysis. We looked at some distributed pathways, we looked at some centralized hydrogen production pathways. And uh, for all the pathways, we looked at the greenhouse gas emissions criteria pollutants and the energy use. Uh, for the economic analysis, we used the H2A model uh, for the same pathways that we did the life cycle analysis, kind of to see how they perform economically and uh, in terms of hydrogen production costs. <clears throat> so uh, hydrogen production, the way we approached it is, uh, kind of try to classify broadly all the different approaches to making renewable hydrogen and then look within each category which specific technologies or, or technology choices are uh, closest to commercial deployment. Uh, and then, you know, what's in the next, uh, next level and then the, the technologies that are in the uh, research scale in, in the lab. So. Uh, with that background, we uh, looked at four different categories, so thermal processes, electrolytic, photolytic, and biochemical. And for thermal processes, we essentially define those as anything that uses uh, thermal energy, thermochemical reactions, uh, <clears throat> to drive hydrogen production. And uh, for electrolytic, we used electrolysis as the um, uh, basis. So essentially, if you're producing hydrogen from water using electrolysis, that's, that falls under the electrolytic process. And photolytic process involves any, uh, uh, anything that has a photochemical or photobiological reaction. Of course, these are in very early stage development. Uh, and then biochemical processes. Uh, by biochemical, I'm just referring to essentially dark fermentation. So um, the aqueous hydrolysis, the conventional pathway of producing, for example, cellulosic ethanol, and then maybe converting that to hydrogen, we group that under thermal, thermal process. So the thermal processes essentially have a combination of, in some cases, biological and thermochemical pathways. Uh, and the biochemical process just refer to dark fermentation. And those are also in very early stage development. <clears throat> so within thermal processes, I'll go over the different technologies in the next couple of slides. Uh, we looked at gasification, uh, reforming uh, of liquids derived by biological processes. Um, we looked at biogas or renewable methane reforming. Um, and we also looked at thermochemical water splitting. So the pathways were selected uh, using a combination of uh, what's uh, being commercially actively developed and, and some feedback from the staff and data available. <coughs> So for thermal processes, uh, you know, there's four different, I think, uh, processes that we looked at. Essentially, uh, gasification, of course, is the dominant pathway uh, to produce uh, renewable hydrogen. And when it comes to pyrolysis, we only looked at uh, flash pyrolysis to liquids and then potential reforming. We did not look at the uh, direct hydrogen production from uh, slow pyrolysis. I don't think there's any potential there. Uh, so when, when it comes to gasification, we classify the gasification processes as two uh, types, directly and indirectly. There's other ways to look at it in terms of the uh, gasification agent or, you know, if the feedstock is dry or wet, 
uh, things like that. So we use this. I think this is an easy way to distinguish technologies. By directly heated gasifiers, what I mean is either air or oxygen blown gasifiers where uh, the combustion that drives the gasification process is essentially taking place inside the gasifier. And then indirectly heated gasifiers are for the most part steam or oxygen driven gasification processes. So you would have two different vessels, a gasifier and then a reformer or a regenerator and there is some type of heat transfer mechanism, usually the hot sand circulating. Uh, there are te uh, example technologies at the Milena gasifier in Europe. We have one at UCR uh, that uses steam and hydrogen. Um, so we, we don't allow the gases to mix, but we transfer the heat from one vessel to another. The advantage is that uh, we can use air for the process without uh, getting the syngas diluted with nitrogen. Uh, we also looked at supercritical and plasma gasification. Um, supercritical gasification especially, I think, enables uh, biomass conversion, but uh, it also has its own challenges in terms of cost and, and some technology barriers. Um, as far as plasma gasification is concerned, I think it's, it has probably has a higher TRL than most of the uh, partial oxidation or, or steam hydrogasification processes, but it's also, I think, primarily aimed at waste uh, destruction uh, because of the very high operating conditions, uh, pressures, and uh, temperatures. Um, so we didn't think of that as a very viable option for direct uh, hydrogen pro uh, production. The <clears throat> technology that was chosen for life cycle analysis was actually partial oxidation-based uh, conventional gasification, which has a TRL of seven. So. The technology readiness levels, I am using the NASA definition. Uh, I have some description in the next slide or, or the slide after of what, what each TRL means. Essentially, TRL 9 is a technology that's commercially deployed. And then TRL 8 is it's ready uh, for commercial deployment. Uh, so something to keep in mind is that the, by definition, these TRLs only uh, deal with the technology readiness. They don't include market or other factors. So. Uh, even though a technology may be ready in terms of piloting or demonstration, uh, that doesn't mean it's necessarily going to be commercialized uh, quickly. The next category is bio-derived liquids reforming. Essentially, this is aqueous processing of biomass to break down the cellulose and to produce sugars, and then you can take the sugars and then reform them in a, in a steam reforming environment. Uh, essentially, you are reforming heavier hydrocarbons instead of methane. Um, and lots of times, different uh, reactor setups are used. For example, fluid bed reactors instead of packed bed reactors, things like that. Um, <clears throat> so there's this other option of using flash pyrolysis to convert the biomass into bio oil or bio crude, and then uh, potentially converting that to hydrogen. Uh, there's, I think, a lot more technological challenges uh, for that approach con compared to the aqueous processing pathway. Uh, primarily bio oils uh, properties, you know, it can be corrosive, it's also uh, tends to have secondary reactions going on unstable. Uh, so for the aqueous processing followed by reforming, the TRL is, is four to five. Essentially the two, uh, two uh, major components of the technology are available, but not uh, much work has been done in terms of demonstrating them as an integrated process. Um, <clears throat> biogas reforming, essentially taking renewable methane and reforming it to produce hydrogen. Uh, this was a pa pathway of particular interest to the staff. Um, and so we looked at three sources for biogas or renewable methane, wastewater treatment plants, uh, digesters converting animal waste and landfill gas upgrading. So obviously these are the most dominant renewable methane production means today. Um, so tech, technologically, I think the individual components are all available. So we assume that once the biogas, raw biogas is upgraded to uh, clean methane, it essentially follows the steam methane reforming process, the distributed uh, steam methane reforming process. So the technology components are available, uh, but for obvious reasons, including economic viability and scales, um, you know, integrating these technologies and operating it as a hydrogen production facility, is, that hasn't happened. It does have a higher TRL than most of the other technologies. 
And thermochemical water splitting, uh, this is where you would have water reacting with either uh, metal oxides or an oxidizable liquid uh, <clears throat> and being converted to hydrogen. And if the heat source is renewable, uh, then you know, the, the carbon footprint can be quite low. So, for example, one of the more popular choices for supplying the thermal energy is concentrated solar power. So the next uh, category, it's electrolytic processes. And here, um, you know, we do have grid electricity-based electrolysis in the mix. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Not uh, technically, you know, 100% uh, renewable pathway, but we did want to look at that. So you can do electrolysis, of course, using either renewable electricity sources or, uh, you know, connect the elect electrolyzer to the grid. Um, so we looked at both options, and of course, technology-wise, you know, there are mature electro electrolysis technologies available. The primary options are alkaline and, and PEM electrolyzers. Um, <clears throat> a lot of literature available. So the primary challenge here is the capital cost of the electrolyzers, and also it really depends on, uh, you know, how much the electricity costs. Uh, for example, if you have uh, very cheap or, almost, or free electricity available from a renewable source, that seems to be the ideal condition for uh, producing hydrogen. So again, this is a case where technology components are available like other uh, more mature pathways. So it has a higher TRL. And uh, you know, we're, the, we're starting to see actual hydrogen refueling stations our hydrogen production stations that are uh, using electrolyzers. We have one in Riverside that's connected to the grid uh, and is used as a refueling station. So it is, uh, you know, actually getting uh, kind of uh, deployed. Uh, for photolytic and biochemical, obviously, these processes are very much in development. Uh, lots of R&D work going on. Uh, there are especially very interesting concepts, I think, in uh, photochemical uh, reactions uh, and, and technologies based on that approach, but the TRL levels are too low to be of uh, to to merit further evaluation. <clears throat> so, based on what we looked at in terms of the different technologies and things, we came up with a pathway list that uh, for each category we selected specific uh, pathways. So, for the near term, which is uh, commercial by Tony Tony. Um, or, or so when I say commercial, I mean um, you know it's ready to be commercially deployed from from a technology development perspective. Uh, so there's of course other factors involved. Uh, I think there are two major options. One is electrolysis, and the other would be biogas reforming. Uh, for electrolysis, it, it doesn't matter where the electricity is coming from. The primary concern there is the uh, net greenhouse gas emission. So. Uh, for biogas reforming, it's a little challenging, but it can be done from a technology perspective. Um, Midterm pathways that, that are expected to be mature uh, uh, by 2025 are biomass gasification and bio-derived liquids reforming. So lots of gasifiers operating in pilot scale today, and hopefully we'll move on to pre-commercial or commercial installations in the next several years. And, you know, long-term pathways are all those still in development. So for the rest of the talk, for the life cycle analysis and the economic analysis, we used, of course, the uh, predominant hydrogen production method today, natural gas reforming, both central and distributed as the baseline, kind of compared the results against uh, those numbers. <clears throat> So this is the technology availability metrics. And um, like I said, you know, if we go back, we're looking at every pathway that, uh, that is listed here is, is uh, fully renewable hydrogen. The only exception is um, uh, electrolysis using grid power. So that was specifically included because of interest. Uh, what we didn't consider in the list was nuclear uh, energy-based pathways. For example, you can use waste nuclear heat to drive uh, thermochemical water splitting. So that wasn't of interest. And we also didn't consider uh, other pathways that could have potentially zero uh, net carbon uh, footprint, for example, uh, coal gasification with uh, carbon capture and sequestration. Uh, or commingled biomass and coal, so we didn't look at that 
either. So we try to look focus on only uh, you know uh, renewable resource based pathways, with the exception of the grid power electrolysis. So uh, technology availability, you know, uh, there's two technologies, like I said, which are expected to be mature enough to uh, be potentially uh, deployed in in uh, in five years. So five years from the point when we started. Um, <clears throat> so both have the TRL of eight, and I have some information on the uh, TRL, uh, what it means. So uh, essentially nine is, you know, it's deployed in commercial scale, and eight is, uh, it's been proven in pilot scale, and it's ready for commercial deployment. Um, so we have biomass gasification, which is TRL seven, and then we have other pathways that are kind of four to five, and then pathways that are in, uh, in the research stage. With that, uh, based on this uh, information, we selected specific pathways for analysis using the Greek model and the H2A model. And uh, so we didn't look at any uh, long-term pathways uh, because of the lack of data and, and uncertainties, in, uncertainties involved. Uh, for the near-term pathways, we looked at electrolysis with uh, renewable and uh, grid power, and then biogas reforming using uh, three different sources for the renewable methane, and then the midterm pathway we picked biomass gasification. So uh, each pathway, depending on the source, was classified as either uh, centralized or distributed. So I'll show, show you in the results essentially which pathways. The renewable power was a centralized pathway. Uh, the grid power uh, was the distributed pathway. Uh, and then the biogas reforming pathways were all distributed hydrogen production pathways, and the biomass gasification used centralized approach. Um, <clears throat> so uh, for the baseline, we had both centralized and distributed natural gas reforming. So in the next few slides, uh, what I wanted to do was just go over uh, each pathway, each of these pathways, kind of like the uh, process, very, very simplified process flow diagram and some of the key assumptions that were used in the study. <clears throat> so I think all of these pathways are, are probably very familiar to um, uh, most people here. So we used um, uh, standard grid assumptions with the exception of whenever there was data available, uh, whether in the literature or in industry reports uh, on in terms of uh, better assumptions or, or efficiencies or things like that, we updated it. Um, but other than that, you know, a lot of the basic assumptions are, are from the model and they're given in the report uh, in detail. So essentially the natural gas reforming pathway is very standard, very commercially mature, uh, uh, operates at very high temperatures, uses nickel catalysts in most cases. Um, and also the other thing is we looked at both gaseous and liquid hydrogen production. So I don't have all the results in the slides uh, here, but uh, the results are in the in the report. So, uh, you know, the North American natural gas is, is cleaned up to be suitable for the catalyst in the methane reformer. And, you know, once the syngas is produced, there's some upgrading to produce pure hydrogen, typically water gas shift reaction, and followed by either compression or liquefaction, depending on the desired end use. So that's the natural gas uh, reforming pathway. And then for biogas reforming, essentially what we did was we looked at each renewable methane source. And, and in this particular case, it shows uh, renewable methane from a wastewater treatment plant. Uh, we looked at each particular renewable methane source. And then once the biogas, which typically has about 40 to 60% CO2 and other contaminants like uh, siloxanes and, and some water and other stuff. So once all of that is cleaned up and you get high methane purity gas, it's assumed that the pathway follows the distributed steam methane reforming approach. Um, <clears throat> so what you have in the cartoon is a typical wastewater treatment plant where uh, there's, a, there's an upgrading uh, section added which produces the high methane concentration gas which then goes through the distributed steam methane reforming step. So for each case uh, of, of renewable methane resource, the other, other two cases being 
animal manure and, and landfill gas, we, we used the uh, appropriate cleanup steps and upgrading steps and then followed it with, um, excuse me, steam methane reforming. So electrolysis pathways are probably, uh, the cartoon is simpler. Um, of course, the, uh, the electricity source, you know, it's, it's either renewable energy, this shows both uh, entering uh, the water electrolysis system, but it's, it's, it's actually done separately. So either renewable or electricity from the grid. Um, and for the grid electricity case, we used uh, the CAMEX grid, which has about, I think, 55% natural gas, 53% natural gas, 30% renewables, and then uh, excluding hydro, and then hydro, and some other sources. Uh, so significant renewables in the mix. Um, one of the higher, uh, you know, renewable mixes. Uh, and then for the uh, renewable power-based uh, pathway, we used a solar, large solar PV plant, assuming that the electricity is exclusively coming from the PV facility. And we also need uh, a water source, of course, for the electrolysis process. So the one thing to uh, consider here is for the other pathways, the carbon uh, source is considered the feedstock. For example, for the gasification pathway, biomass is the feedstock. Uh, for the biogas reforming pathways, the the raw biogas is considered the feedstock, but for this electrolysis-based pathways, we assume that the uh, electricity is the feedstock, not, the, not water. Uh, uh, for the other cases, electricity is considered a utility, uh, but for this case, it's considered the feedstock and water is considered a utility. So that's, that's a minor uh, distinction. <clears throat> then as I mentioned, for biomass gasification, we picked a Ox, uh, partial oxidation gasifier, even though it says air or oxygen, um, which uh, I think based on current technology status is probably the more mature gasification pathway if we don't include um, other options such as plasma gasification. So um, it's, it's a standard gasification pathway shown here. You essentially have some biomass size reduction and potential pretreatment. Uh, to prepare it for the specific type of gasifier. Uh, and then the gasification produces a syngas, <coughs> which is essentially very high percentages of methane, uh, hydrogen and carbon monoxide, and then some upgrading and, and potential water gas shift to increase the hydrogen percentage, compression or liquefaction. And the feedstock is biomass harvested from a 50 mile radius. Uh, <coughs> A for, a, for a centralized uh, facility. So those are the, all the major, four major pathways. Now I'll, I'll go into the uh, specific assumptions and results from the life cycle uh, analysis and also the economic analysis. Uh, so the basic assumptions for the pathway I discussed are, are true for both uh, LCA and the economic analysis, unless there's a specific uh, exception. Stated. So, you know, like I mentioned before, we use the California Greek Tier 2 model, and, you know, Tier 1 is, is customized for uh, first-generation biofuels, and Tier 2, of course, is for the next-generation biofuels. And it has uh, very California-specific assumptions uh, different than from the original Greek model, and, and the uh, global warming potentials are the IPCC 2007 uh, numbers. And we used 2015 uh, when the project was initially proposed as the analysis year. So that's why the five-year commercialization time frame refers to 2020. Um, <clears throat> so I think a lot of the other assumptions, I stated them earlier. Um, we used California crude as the regional crude. And the end use uh, for hydrogen for the LCA and the economic analysis is for, as a transportation fuel. Um, and we looked ex uh, exclusively as a fuel cell vehicle. Uh, with specific miles per gallon. Uh, I think Marshall has information on uh, hydrogen use for other purposes, uh, forklifts and so on, but uh, we stuck, we, you know, we're uh, focused only on light duty vehicles. And there are some other assumptions on natural gas transmission and, and other stuff, but we, you know, all of those are listed in the uh, report. So we don't normally include any co-product credits in, for these plants. So the, the energy consumed, that's, this slide shows the total energy consumed 
uh, and the results are for the well-to-wheel section. So, of course, GREET, uh, California GREET will give you results for well-to-tank and tank-to-wheel. And the slides I have are all uh, well-to-wheel, uh, but the numbers for well-to-tank are available. Uh, it's just a standard add-on for the tank-to-wheel part because we're looking at a single uh, vehicle technology. So, um, <clears throat> one thing to note for the renewable pathways is that GREET gives uh, energy credits and, and some avoided emission credits. So, uh, for example, a wastewater treatment plant, uh, if it uses part of the biogas for the uh, operate for its operation, uh, then it gets a credit, energy credit for uh, uh, you know energy that would other otherwise have been fossil energy that was used. So, uh, in in some cases, you end up with a negative energy credit, uh, like in this case for the wastewater treatment plant. And it really depends on uh, the mode of operation of that specific facility and, uh, you know, the scale and what kind of uh, credit they're, they're receiving. So that's something to keep in mind. But with that, um, of course, the uh, total energy consumed are all uh, significantly high for gasification and uh, grid-based electrolysis because or the underlying uh, processes are energy intensive. And gasification normally is... Uh, is is on the higher side, but in this case, you know, it's just below a grid-based electricity. But uh, the solar or uh, PV-based uh, electrolysis and the uh, other pathways have a lower energy consumption, but this looks, of course, very different um, when you look at the fossil energy consumed, which is, I think, very important. Uh, and, and in every plot that I have, uh, if there's a C in parathesis, it's a central centralized pathway, and if it's a D, then it's a distributed pathway. So for uh, fossil energy consumption, you know, obviously all the renewable uh, hydrogen production pathways result in significantly reduced fossil energy consumption uh, compared to both the baseline and the grid uh, power-based electrolysis. So, which I think is attractive from a, uh, a greenhouse gas, net greenhouse gas use perspective, because this translates into the greenhouse gas uh, emissions. <coughs> so, here are the greenhouse gas emissions for gaseous hydrogen production. Um, you know, the wastewater treatment plant-based pathway offers the lowest emissions, and, and the grid electricity-based uh, pathway has the highest net uh, 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 CO2 equivalent greenhouse gas emissions per mile driven. And, uh, you know, there's also significant greenhouse gas emission reduction when we use either the uh, renewable power-based electrolysis or the uh, biomass gasification-based uh, conversion approach. So there are some, uh, you know, variations in these numbers um, b depending on specific assumptions or technology choices but the trend uh, is essentially the same, yes. Yeah, so the baseline is in the far left, North American natural gas. So <clears throat> those are the typical, uh, like I said, the trend still holds regardless of, uh, even if we change some of the specific assumptions and we look at the sensitivity to uh, either technology type or other parameters. So I have the just the greenhouse gas emission results for liquid hydrogen production, um, and and it's you know of course higher emissions and uh, from the energy use perspective also higher because of the um, energy intensity that goes with the liquefaction process. So here again the trends are are uh, still the same. Essentially the numbers look a little bit different. So again. Uh, renewable power-based electrolysis and biomass gasification and, and you know, some of the biogas pathways offer, um, offer the most greenhouse gas emission reduction. And some of these pathways also receive an avoided emission credit, for example, the animal manure-based uh, pathway because they are not uh, ex uh, f forced to uh, you know, convert the methane into CO2 in, in many cases. Okay, so those are the results of the life cycle analysis. And the next few slides, a uh, couple of slides, I think, uh, talk about the economic analysis. We we're using version 3.1 of the S2A model. And uh, it's, it's a standard uh, discounted cash flow analysis with 
um, you know, many of the uh, standard assumptions that go with such uh, evaluations. Uh, minimum internal rate of return is set at 10%, and you know there's a total very high tax rate, but no sales tax. And in in a lot of cases, there may be industrial electricity used in the plant, and you know there's a price conversion factor for that, and for natural gas. And one thing that we set uh, did set uh, uh, the debt at 80%, and and the interest rate was set at 6%. So there's a, there was a lot of sensitivity analysis that was done for these numbers. Um, and I have a couple of slides on that, but uh, the report has more results from the sensitivity analysis. Um, so these are the uh, levelized production costs in dollars per kilogram of hydrogen. Um, and and uh, electrolysis tends to be on the higher side for production, both grid and solar or, or renewable power. Uh, <clears throat> Primarily, I think, uh, because of the uh, elect electrolyzer cost and also in terms of the, um, you know, plant uh, requirements, things like that. So uh, biomass, actually, biomass gasification offers one of the uh, least expensive approaches to making a renewable hydrogen uh, from a total, completely renewable feedstock. So if you look at the uh, contribution of different uh, components to the total cost, um, the feedstock costs uh, or the major contributor, and then the capital costs come in at number two. So, of course, DOE's goal for renewable hydrogen is to get to $2 uh, a kilogram. And I think that's reachable, uh, perhaps not in the target uh, time frame that they've set, but definitely reachable in the next, um, you know, several years. And you know you can see some of the technologies, especially biomass gasification, are pretty close to that target, and could potentially get there with enough uh, investment and uh, support, for, uh, regulatory support. Um, so, like I mentioned, we did a lot of sensitivity analysis, looking at uh, what effect different parameters have on these uh, cost numbers, because a lot of these. Uh, values that are used are, are uh, uh, drawn from commercial facilities that have these components, but for a different purpose. For example, a reformer that's used for a uh, fossil natural gas plant, we're kind of uh, reper you know, uh, using that information for a biogas reforming facility in a distributed, um, uh, a distributed hydrogen production case, or electrolyzers are in operation uh, for in, in facilities, so we're using numbers, so it's we, you know, we looked at what changes when we change some of these numbers. And the scale for the distributed facilities is around, uh, I think, 1,500 kilograms a day uh, for hydrogen and then 50,000 for the centralized uh, biomass and renewable power-based hydrogen production. And then the centralized natural gas is much larger. So it's, it's kind of very uh, directly related to the um, you know, the cost distributed in the previous slide in terms of the major contributors to the cost, they actually have the biggest impact on, or, or the cost uh, effect, cost values are most sensitive to those parameters. And, you know, the lower the contribution is, it, it actually results in reduced impact. So this is for the baseline case, centralized natural gas reforming. And, um, <clears throat> For one of the specific renewable pathways to centralize biomass gasification, the sensitivity is not, um, I think it's, it's a little bit uh, lower, uh, but, and the primary sensitivity again is, is the feedstock uh, price, um, and then the total capital investment. So other, other parameters play a minor role, uh, you know, like operating costs and things like that, but those are the two major uh, factors. So those are, those are kind of like, a, uh, there was a quick overview of some of the key results. Um, <clears throat> and I'm, I'm going to now uh, kind of go over and summarize the results and mention a couple of uh, recommendations that, were, uh, that we arrived at. So, you know, we looked at different technology options and, and uh, which ones are potentially ready. And once again, the TRL definition looks exclusively at the technology readiness. And, and of course, the market and the regulatory environment will play a key role. And I think, you know, uh, most of us here will agree that without that support, 
uh, many of these technologies will likely not be commercialized uh, in the time frame that we're discussing. Um, so the five-year uh, near-term time frame, I think water electrolysis-based hydrogen production has the highest potential for biogas reforming, even though it's uh, technologically the components may be available. From a practical perspective, uh, you know, it's going to be very challenging, especially given the distributed nature of biogas um, and also the costs associated with hydrogen uh, transportation or, or uh, connecting to some type of infrastructure. So the midterm, I think biomass gasification has very good potential to uh, be a viable hydrogen production pathway, but um, it, it will really depend on hydrogen demand and what type of uh, regulatory or policy support uh, is available, because uh, if there's not enough hydrogen demand, there's really, you know, it's, it's unlikely that gasification is, because, because it's a very capital intensive and uh, it takes a lot of effort to develop these technologies and commercialize them, it's unlikely that it'll become commercial by that time frame. So for LCA, the biogas reforming based pathways offer a lot of significant greenhouse gas emission reduction, uh, but from a you know, very uh, likely to uh, be commercialized perspective, I think uh, renewable power based electrolysis, especially from the context of uh, the supply demand mismatch that we have uh, in the grid today and which is which will get uh, increasingly severe as we add more renewables there's there's a very likely chance that uh, new uh, renewable power plants can be built with an option of using part of the electricity for hydrogen production when you know they know they can anticipate that the grid won't take as much of the power that they produce in that case, the feedstock could actually be free. The electricity could be free or nearly free. And that, I think, offers the probably the uh, brightest chance for 100% renewable hydrogen production in the next few years. Um, so there are a lot of, and, and the approach is, of course, called power to gas. And there's some debate on whether to inject the hydrogen directly into the pipeline or to convert that to methane. Um, so Marshall has some information on hydrogen safety associated with that, but I think either way, uh, you know, power to gas is is a potential option for renewable hydrogen production, not just from uh, hydrogen uh, demand perspective or hydrogen production perspective, but also as a means of storage uh, to shift power seasonally instead of relying on batteries, which are more short to short term storage. So the total energy consumption is, is lowest for the biogas reforming pathways, but you know, all the renewable pathways result in significant reduction of fossil energy use. So in terms of what looks most attractive, I think a centralized biomass gasification offers the uh, most cost-effective approach, but that, I, uh, as I mentioned, should be placed in the context of uh, the challenges associated with commercializing biomass gasification technologies. So it could potentially um, you know, uh, hit roadblocks if there's not enough support. And electrolysis, uh, the cost of electrolysis is still a challenge, but I think those costs are, are coming down and, and uh, there's a lot of information available on that. Um, and, you know, if the feedstock costs are, are reduced, then that, uh, that helps. <coughs> so in terms of specific recommendations, I think uh, they're, they're uh, pretty obvious, very broad. Uh, we're not making any specific policy suggestions or things like that, but um, you know, essentially, I think very focused evaluation of both specific technologies that are in development or, or undergoing commercialization, and then help uh, support them uh, by providing R D and D uh, funds or other means of support and policy support is key. And also, from a broader perspective, commercialization approaches, for example, looking at uh, uh, using power to gas or some other uh, pathway which has multiple uh, uses uh, and is more attractive than a standalone technology that all it does is produces hydrogen is key. And then the most appealing approaches should be uh, you know, supported using regulatory uh, incentives or other means. Um, so that's all I had. Uh, Today, um, I'm going to hand it over to Marshall, and you know we'll have questions at the end of the talk. Thank you.
Okay. Uh, so I'm going to start talking about <clears throat> uh, the first of the tasks uh, that I mentioned that, that we did, which is leveraging uh, the natural gas infrastructure, the pipeline infrastructure uh, for hydrogen distribution. Um, <clears throat> so hydrogen can be produced locally, but some hydrogen will likely be produced and need to be distributed either through uh, tanker trailers or through pipelines or perhaps some other method. Um, the cost for a dedicated hydrogen pipeline is expected to be very high, so the question is, to what extent can we use the natural gas infrastructure that's already in place? Some of the benefits for util utilizing natural gas infrastructure, uh, obviously you would not have to uh, build a hydrogen, extensive hydrogen uh, distribution system, so you would uh, save on, the, uh, on building the hydrogen pipelines. Uh, injecting hydrogen into the natural gas pipelines can reduce the need for hydrogen storage, probably not eliminate it, but it could reduce the need uh, and the cost for, for building hydrogen storage systems uh, at, for example, fueling stations. Um, also having hydrogen available in the pipeline essentially over a wide region uh, can help accelerate the introduction of, of pure hydrogen applications such as fuel cell vehicles. So what I'm going to do is uh, basically summarize a, a bunch of studies that have looked at a number of issues that relate to what is the <clears throat> maximum concentration uh, by volume for hydrogen in the natural gas pipeline. The first set of issues involve safety. Uh, one thing is gas buildup of blends compared to gas buildup of nat uh, pure natural gas. Uh, that's expected not to be a problem, up to 50% concentrations by volume. Uh, severity of confined explosions, so the gas leaks or gets vented somehow. Uh, there's a modest increase for blends up to 20% uh, of hydrogen compared to pure natural gas. As you get higher than that, obviously, the, the safety gets worse and worse. Uh, there was a Gas Technology Institute study that looked at uh, risk from a number of different failure uh, uh, types. Uh, failure modes considered were corrosion, material defects, natural forces, uh, 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 excavation, equipment malfunction, uh, issues with operations, and so on. Um, the risk does increase with hydrogen percentage in the natural gas. The risk is considered or was considered not significantly higher than pure natural gas for blends up to 20%. Uh, blends over 20% can have significant risks in service lines. Those are uh, lines that have um, uh, operate in more confined spaces. And the more confined uh, space you have, the more uh, risk that hydrogen buildup produces. Uh, the study basically found that the risks were actually unacceptable for blends of greater than 50 percent. So leakage is another issue. Obviously, the more, leak, e more leakage you have, you're losing product. And if you lose too much product, it's an economic problem. Uh, hydrogen leaks faster than natural gas because the molecules are much smaller, and they can leak through threads or uh, mechanical joints more easily than natural gas. Um, 20 percent blends in distribution lines can roughly double the total gas losses. Uh, and obviously, higher concentrations of, of hydrogen will lead to greater leakage. Uh, losses in service lines where the pressure is lower tend to be less. The higher the pressure in the pipeline, the greater the chance of leakage. Uh, NREL did a study that looked at uh, potential losses from 20% concentrations by volume and found that uh, they found that it was economically insignificant at that level. Okay, another problem is durability, uh, durability of the pipeline materials. Hydrogen can degrade these materials through either physical or chemical interactions. Uh, typically, they may lead to lower tensile strength, uh, less inductive ductility. Uh, operators have to inspect pipelines, whether there's hydrogen or not, uh, to maintain and assess the pipelines. These are uh, their programs called in integrity management that do that. Uh, the degradation from, from hydrogen will depend on the pipeline materials. It will depend on the pressure, on the temperature, uh, and on the hydrogen concentration. And a GTI study uh, looked at the cost, uh, the increased cost of these integrity management programs 
uh, and found that generally for hydrogen concentrations below 50 percent, uh, for relatively modest pressures below 66 bar and system design lifetimes of left, less than 50 years, uh, they felt that the cost increases from adding hydrogen would be less than 10 percent. So if you inject hydrogen into a pipeline, the whole goal is that you're going to distribute it somewhere and then use it at a, a fueling station for fuel cell vehicles. In that case, you have to extract the hydrogen and you must purify it. You can't use the hydrogen in an un, in a relatively impure form. Uh, you need very high purity. So typically what you might use is pressure swing absorption, membrane separation, or electrochemical separation, which uses fuel cells to do the separation of hydrogen. All of these tend to work better at higher partial pressures. And in most cases, you're sacrificing the recovery rate of hydrogen for the purity. So the higher the purity you want, you're going to re recover a smaller percentage of hydrogen from the pipeline. Uh, an NREL study looked at uh, PSA extraction, assumed that they would want at least 80% recovery. For 10% concentration, the increase in cost or the cost for extraction was roughly a little over three, to perhaps a little over $8 a kilogram, depending on the volume per day, going from 100 to 1,000 kilograms a day. The higher the volume, the lower the cost. For 20% concentration, those costs come down a little bit. But if you look at that, these are still very high costs compared to what you really need in a, um, in a fueling station for hydrogen. Now, there is one option. Um, pipelines have uh, what are called pressure reduction facilities. Basically, they're regions where you monitor the hydrogen so uh, the pipeline uh, is diverted to a low pressure area. Um, if you extract the hydrogen at those regions, uh, you don't have to recompress the natural gas, and that saves you quite potentially quite a bit of money. Uh, that study indicated that perhaps the cost could be uh, 0.3 to $1.3 dollars per kilogram for extraction. So at the lower end, that's probably not a significant effect on the total cost of hydrogen at a fueling station. Another issue is end use. Uh, applications. So if you inject hydrogen, even if you're going to extract it, there's still going to be a significant amount of hydrogen in the pipeline when it reaches an end use application, such as a boiler, a stove, uh, power generation equipment. And those systems have to be able to operate on that blend of hydrogen and natural gas and not have issues. Um, adverse effects are, um, can depend on the composition of the natural gas, uh, type of appliance, the age of the appliance, uh, and for example, stationary natural gas engines will likely have to modify their control strategy if the percentage of hydrogen is too high. Uh, studies seem to indicate that acceptable range without requiring modifications to equipment are in the 5 to 20 percent uh, concentration, and that depends again on the appliance, the age of the appliance, the composition of the natural gas, and so on. So to summarize, um, based on safety, durability, and end use applications, a range of 5 to 15 percent concentration by volume seems to be reasonable. Again, that's a function of a number of things. Typically, the lower end there is driven more by the end use applications. Natural gas pipelines operate in a wide range of parameters, uh, natural gas composition, pressure, temperature, uh, materials of the pipeline can all vary. Uh, and that variation can affect the hydrogen concentration that makes sense or is appropriate. Uh, modifications to integrity management programs will be necessary with hydrogen introduction, uh, and caution must be exercised in utilizing concentrations above 15 percent. So some recommendations. One would be making funding available. Uh, for a detailed analysis of the distribution cost of hydrogen blended into natural gas pipelines. Uh, and this cost obviously should be compared to other distribution options. And I mentioned that uh, pipelines can have a very wide range of uh, parameters, temperature, pressure, and so on. Um, and so uh, particular pipeline regions could benefit from having studies that look at necessary modifications to those pipelines to allow hydrogen blending at various percentages at, at reasonable safety and durability and so on. 
uh, finally, to uh, conduct studies to understand the various uh, blend percentages, the effect of various blend uh, percentages on end-use applications. Okay, so I'm going to switch over to the final topic, which is potential markets for hydrogen outside of on-road vehicles. Uh, the markets that we considered were material handlers or forklifts, airport ground support equipment, transport refrigeration units, and backup power, for example, for tele telecommunications. The last one, backup power for telecommunications, it's expected that the fuel cell market could be quite significant. The problem for hydrogen demand is that the reliability of the grid is so high that the actual usage for these backup systems is almost negligible. And so we have not considered it in this analysis. So we, we will look at the other three. So the me methodology we used to estimate the demand was basically first determining the fleet stock uh, for each sector, forklifts, uh, ground support equipment, and TRUs. Uh, project this stock out for 10 years. Essentially, we're looking at the demand over a 10-year time period. It's sort of a midterm time period. And we, we based that projected stock increase on macroeconomic projections uh, for the California uh, gross state product. Those projections uh, averaged out to roughly 2.3% per year increase. Uh, we estimated the maximum market share for fuel cells in those various applications based on reports and discussions with stakeholders. This part has by far the greatest uncertainty in this whole analysis. Uh, the uncertainty absolutely dominates uh, any other uncertainty. And finally, we have to estimate the actual fuel cell hydrogen usage in these applications based on either knowing the total energy usage, uh, activity in hours times the average power, and finally, making use of uh, fuel cell efficiency, which we took for these products as roughly 50%. So for material handlers, uh, to get the stock, uh, we looked at Industrial Truck Association market intelligence reports, which give uh, forklift sales as a function of year for the entire U.S. Based on those sales and expected lifetimes, we uh, looked at those sales over the year and pro not projected, but estimated the actual present stock of forklifts in the U.S. Once we did that, we uh, looked at what we thought the uh, stock would be in California by taking the fact that California is roughly 12 percent of the U.S. population. Um, and then we expanded that stock over 10 years based on the macroeconomic projections for California. Forklifts have five classes. Three of them are electric and two of them, class four and five, are ICE. Um, in the uh, market intelligence report, toward later years, it looks like fewer and fewer forklifts are being purchased in class four or five, internal combustion engine, and more being uh, purchased in uh, electric. So we assumed for this study that 15% of the future projected ICE forklifts would be purchased as class one or two as electric forklifts by 2026. Uh, then uh, we got estimates of the energy usage per year for forklifts in different classes. Uh, class three, which is the smallest, uses about 5.2 megawatt hours of electricity per year. Uh, 6,000 to 8,000 pound forklifts, it's closer to 18 megawatt hours. And then large forklifts of uh, almost 20,000 pounds are over 50 megawatt hours. Now, discussions with stakeholders indicated that an upper limit of fuel cells for forklifts could be as high as 30% by 2026. That's sort of based on two things. Right now, there actually are a significant number of fuel cell forklifts around the United States. A couple of years ago, that number was roughly 7,700. There are benefits of forklifts being fuel cell compared to battery electric. Uh, one benefit is that you don't have to have as many chargers in your facility to charge every battery electric forklift over a long number of hours. Fuel cell forklifts can charge much faster and you don't need this extra space in your facility to house the chargers. Uh, there are other benefits as well in terms of maintenance and operations cost. So the, the thought that possibly you could reach as high as 30% by 2026 uh, seemed to be reasonable. 
For airport ground support equipment, uh, we looked at a report from the Airport Cooperative Research Program uh, that gave the stock of ground support equipment in U.S. airports. FAA data shows that roughly 11% of employments are in California, so we were able to take that stock and convert it to a California stock. It was a very nice study done by the Los Angeles World Airports Environment and Land Use Planning Division that looked to see what the benefits would be to electrify uh, their ground support equipment. And they, in particular, looked at battery electric forklifts to understand the energy usage compared to diesel, oh, sorry, not forklifts, air, ground support equipment, to look at the energy demands for electric compared to diesel. Uh, but that study allowed us to, uh, to understand what the electricity demand would be, and then we used that demand for, for, a forklift, uh, for hydrogen forklifts. Uh, the types of equipments, equipment, uh, in-ground support equipment are tugs, belt loaders, cargo tractors, lifts, carts, sweepers, and so on. Now, currently, fuel cell ground support equipment is essentially in the demonstration phase, um, although cargo tractors are getting more attention than other ground support equipment. So, again, discussions with various people indicated that maybe cargo tractors could be commercialized up to 5% of sales by 2026, the other ground support equipment would be at, uh, as little as 2%. For TRUs, we're actually able to use the ARB uh, TRU emissions inventory database to get stock and activity hours of usage for TRUs. Uh, various studies and ARB personnel gave us the average electric power for TRUs of different sizes small ones less than 11 horsepower, medium 11 to 25, and large ones greater than 25. There are also what are called out-of-state uh, uh, TRUs. Uh, and so you can see the electric power varies from about a little over two uh, kilowatts and uh, up to about 10. One of the problems is fuel prices, both diesel being low and hydrogen being high, make commercialization a little difficult. So stakeholders, suggested that maybe there would be a maximum of 5% penetration in sales uh, by 2026. The incentives, any incentives that might be available would likely focus on California TRUs, so we assume that out-of-state sales for fuel cells would be 0%. Okay, so the next several slides I'm going to show uh, when you put all that together, what the hydrogen, potential hydrogen demand could be from roughly now out through 2026. Um, these, these basically are sort of maximum expected hydrogen demand based on what people thought would be the maximum penetration into the market for these applications. Forklifts, as you'll see, dominate the potential demand. That's based on the fact that forklifts sort of have a head start, so there are fuel cell forklifts already in the market. Expected potential share in 2026 was 30% compared to much lower for the other, uh, the other applications. So uh, sales start, or usage starts mod well modest, actually still fairly large, at not quite 2 million kilograms about now. Um, but could rise to perhaps 18 million kilograms by 2026. So airport ground support equipment, again, this is going to be much less. We assume that until 2020, the demand would be close to zero. Uh, we, have a we assumed a linear increase uh, from then until 2026, but you see even by that time, you don't even reach 100, um, uh, basically 100,000 kilograms per year usage, quite a bit less than the forklifts. Uh, TRUs are a little bit better, again, starting around 2020, rising to maybe uh, 600,000 kilograms per year by 2026. When you put that all together, the curve essentially looks the same as the forklift curve. It's very slightly higher, but it's hard to see a difference. With forklifts, you were slightly below 18 million kilograms in 2026. When you put them all together, you're very slightly above 18, kilogram, 18 million kilograms. <clears throat> so barriers to commercialization, by far the major one is cost. That's cost of the fuel cell. 
cost of the hydrogen and cost of potential infrastructure that must be installed at a location when you start purchasing fuel cell, uh, whether it's TRUs or forklifts, uh, ground support equipment. For TRUs, range is a potential issue. If there is not hydrogen fueling stations or fueling available, for example, along the highway, the fact that the range is limited may preclude, for example, long haul TRUs, uh, trucks with TRUs from having, uh, using fuel cells, and it, uh, may, they may be limited to fleets that return to the base for refueling. Another significant barrier is uncertainty. Uh, fuel cell forklifts have um, significant sales, so any company or, or fleet that is interested in a fuel cell forklift can talk to other fleets that have been using them, and they may get a, a pretty good sense of what to expect in terms of cost, reliability, and so on. But for airport ground support equipment and for TRUs, any fleet interested in a fuel cell, uh, ground support equipment or TRU, will have uncertainty about things like reliability, cost, and performance. Another significant barrier is actually competition from battery electric devices. So all of these applications, battery electric uh, or designs actually have a head start over fuel cells. So people may want to continue to go with battery electric designs rather than convert over to fuel cells. So a couple of strategies to perhaps overcome these barriers. Uh, emission standards can be reduced, for example, off-road diesel engines. Um, stricter standards could make fleets prefer to go to uh, zero emission technologies that could look more attractive. Uh, to reduce concerns about reliability and performance and uncertainty and so on, uh, to the extent that there are demonstration programs for, say, ground support equipment or TRUs, um, these demonstration uh, programs could be closely monitored and information relating to fuel use, performance, reliability, costs, and so on could be widely disseminated so that other fleets that are more interested could see what's actually happening. Another possibility is actually locating fuel cell products or these applications uh, near already existing markets. So to the extent that, for example, you have fuel cells operating in a warehouse, if TRUs could be coming to that warehouse, you might be able to use the same hydrogen infrastructure and lower the cost, assuming it's compatible. So that's sort of a hub and spoke uh, kind of possibility. And then the final thing is, of course, there's always incentives and subsidies uh, to help move in this direction. Okay, that's it. Thank you. So I guess we'll open it up for questions. Yeah, thank you, uh, Marshall and Arun. That was great. Um, and I apologize that we've run over time a bit, but I'm glad to see there are still people in the audience. Um, we don't have any uh, questions from anyone on the web yet, but I just want to remind anyone that's listening on the web that you can email your questions in and we'll answer them. But if there are any questions in the audience, um, yeah. Hi, uh, you mentioned the case that the, the hydrogen production going to be used uh, as a, in combination with the renewable electricity. Uh, have you figured out the cost? What would be the cost if you excess electricity from renewable use to uh, produce uh, uh, hydrogen? Yeah. Oh, okay. Maybe they have the follow. -up. Yeah, so we, we do have the cost for the renewable electricity case. Um, uh, so the, in this case, it's specifically assumed that the plant is exclusively built for hydrogen production. So I, I mentioned that what would be more attractive is we did uh, look at some information on, for example, if you have uh, a very large uh, hundreds of megawatt solar plant and and if you were looking at potential curtailment and part of, the hyd uh, part of the electricity is used for hydrogen production, that would actually reduce the net uh, production cost because you have a revenue stream from 
you know, the electricity going to the grid. And But uh, if we look at building a solar plant exclusively for hydrogen production, it actually turns out to be the most expensive way to uh, produce renewable hydrogen. But you don't know for the excess one. The excess electricity. Yeah, if so you know. the, the excess electricity is, is uh, very difficult to figure out because right now, if you look at the way uh, power is, uh, curtailment is managed by the ISO, it doesn't specify the source. So they, they bid online on the actual price uh, that, you know, they, they will pay a certain amount for somebody to go off the grid. And it could be a natural gas plant. It could be a wind power plant. So uh, it's it's there's not a set uh, value for the excess power that's available. So that, I think, in, in terms of, uh, you know, more approaching it in a more structured way, it's done better in Europe uh, in, in some locations than here. So when we look at the uh, electricity being potentially available for free or almost free, the cost reduces significantly because you know the 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 I, I mentioned during the talk that the feedstock for electrolysis is electricity. So if you look at the solar case, the feedstock cost is like the highest cost, which which is essentially the you know building the plant, and uh, so that could be very low if the electricity is excess. Thanks. Uh, this is the, the number you are uh, showing. There is a production cost. Mm -hmm. Is not the a price to consumer, huh? So if you add the distribution and retail cost, what would be the... This is actually at the gate, at the, uh, at the, at the refueling station. Okay, at the gate. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Yes. So for the scenario where you're doing uh, injection into the natural gas pipeline, did you look at the possibility of converting it to synthetic natural gas first before injecting it? Um, so I'm not, is this for me? Or? Wow. <laughs> okay, so uh, I, I think for, from my perspective, we've only looked at hydrogen delivered directly to a refueling station. Uh, so in terms of adding hydrogen to the existing infrastructure, we didn't look at that from a life cycle or cost perspective. So Marshall, uh, you know, maybe has some. Yeah, we only looked at, or I only looked at injecting hydrogen and what to expect in terms of costs for extraction um, and maximum percentages that would satisfy safety, durability, uh, end use issues. So uh, all we really looked at is injecting hydrogen, actually any hydrogen, whether it's renewably created or not. Of course, it doesn't matter once it's in the pipeline. Uh, but that, that's really all we looked at. Okay, thanks. So, so I think, you know, from, from not just, uh, not from based on our results, uh, essentially, you know, we've looked at for other studies and, and there's literature available. I think what happens is the key question is, are we allowed to do it in terms of injecting hydrogen into the pipeline? In the U.S., there's no regulation on uh, how much hydrogen can be injected. Of course, natural gas from the field comes with a percentage of hydrogen, and that's monitored and regulated, but only when someone tries to inject it, you know, they will, they'll then establish a set of standards. In, in Europe, if you look at the percentage, you can inject anywhere from, like, up to 10%, depending on the location. So if there's a, uh, you know, LNG, L, liquefied hydrogen station or LNG station downstream, then the hydrogen that can be injected is very uh, restricted. So it, it, in terms of cost, we looked at the numbers and there is a significant added cost to methanation. So it would only make sense if, uh, you know, regula if the regulatory environment doesn't allow uh, any hydrogen injection because it's unsafe or you know, has long-term impact to the pipeline. So UC Irwin also has done some experimental work on uh, leakage rates and, and compared them. And their guess is that the replacement costs would significantly increase. So instead of replacing the pipelines every 40 years, you would have to do it something like every 25 years uh, because of the significantly higher hydrogen percentages in the gas mix. So I, I don't know if that helps. But.
I also had a question. Um, the sensitivity analysis, you know, showed that the feedstock was one of the things it was most sensitive to, and I was just wondering if that came from uh, having to transport the feedstock around and maybe, you know, at the end, Marshall was talking about this hub and spoke model for distribution, but what about like a geospatial analysis for um, just collecting feedstock? Is it the collection of the feedstock or is it just you have like different prices for manure or food waste or? Uh, so it's a, it's a combination of prices. So the collection is a key uh, component, but what we assume is that the uh, feedstock processing is not uh, so the feedstock is delivered at the gate uh, at some specified uh, size and uh, quality. Uh, so, for example, biomass uh, there's a size on the wood chips or pellets uh, that they're delivering. So it's the collection cost and then transportation and then some size reduction or uh, some pre-treatment before it gets to the plant. So. All of those combined contribute to that cost. Yeah, and I was also wondering, you know, for um, in some other studies that CARB has funded for uh, renewable diesel um, and um, also just for RNG production, we've done geospatial analyses to try and figure out, you know, where to locate um, like collection facilities. Mm -hmm. uh, to make it cheaper. And I was just wondering if uh, anyone has done that for like this like hydrogen uh, pathway and or if that's a research gap that remains. Um, and then also, you know, a geospatial analysis, I think for optimizing the use of hydrogen as both fuel and for these other uses like TRUs and um, yeah, the airport equipment. Because it seems like you could have like a TRU filling station at an airport, you know, along I-5, and that would work out well. Yeah, so I think there, there's information, there's, there have been studies on biomass distribution and availability. So, you know, when I say biomass, I'm using it broadly, waste and other. Uh, so there's a couple of studies that I know, and we've done uh, some work on looking at meth conversion to renewable methane and where it's ideally located. Uh, so there's a UC Davis on RNG production from, you know, potential, which was funded by, um, probably by the ARB or, or CEC. That was yeah. Us. yeah. <laughs> so, um, but I haven't seen anything that looks at that type of analysis for hydrogen. Uh, but I think it, sh you know, it could be done relatively. It should be a straightforward uh, because once you know the biomass and it's producing hydrogen, is typically an added cost to producing methane. So. Yeah, because are there already a lot of steam reformers around where you have to take the biomass? Or do we need a study to figure out where the most ideal place is to put those So, reformers? So the steam reformers are all located, I, don't, I, I, I think the steam reformers are all located in industrial large-scale facilities. There are very few uh, distributed steam methane reformers around uh, that can be used for any of these purposes. So these projects would have to be custom-built uh, in terms of, uh, you know, if we're looking at biogas conversion or, or other syngas uh, conversion. So, uh, you know, these w would have to be located near where the feedstock is uh, available for relatively cheaper prices or relatively, you know, uh, lower uh, transportation costs. Okay, just one more and then I'll pass sure. around. But uh, I was also just wondering if the infrastructure for filling up, you know, something with hydrogen varies between light duty, heavy duty TRUs, forklifts, or if that infrastructure could service all of those things. So it, it can vary and it does presently vary, but it doesn't have to, right? So. Um, TRUs don't necessarily use the same infrastructure that, say, forklifts would. Um, that'd be one thing that you would like to standardize. And so everybody could uh, basically fill from the same uh, dispensers, you know, the same type of dispensers, or at least from the same station. Um, it's not obvious right now. People aren't, since there's not a lot of demand for these things, I mean, other than forklifts, which typically... Uh, people design that and put in a hydrogen 
dispensing system where they're uh, buying uh, hydrogen forklifts. So they look at their own system and they're, they're happy. People aren't really looking like they have with vehicles where everybody has to standardize because it would be insane not to, right? It hasn't gotten to that point yet. Um, so I, I think it, it needs to get, well, it doesn't need to, but it would certainly help get there if people are looking at, hey, maybe we would like to get you know, fuel cell TRUs or whatever, if they could look around and see who has hydrogen applications, does it make sense for us to look and see if there's a synergy there? Um, we're actually doing a study where we're actually doing that for trucks. Now, this obviously is on road, but uh, trucks that are in, used in fleets, typically fleets fuel at their own station, right? And they just worry about themselves. Well, if the station is relatively cheap, that's not a problem. But for hydrogen, that can be a problem. So what we're looking at is, could different fleets actually use a single station and therefore increase the demand and lower the cost? But that's something that, you know, we're just starting now, and that's for trucks, which we expect will be commercialized, well, hopefully, maybe sooner than, than some of these other applications beside forklifts. So the bottom line is people have to actively go and see, does it make sense to locate hydrogen applications in a particular location where there's a synergy with other applications. And I don't know that people are actually doing that. Okay, I'll share now. Okay. When do we get to see the report? Uh, it's uh, out, it's on the website, the same website for this uh, seminar. Uh, I think actually the seminar website will take you to the project website and then it's posted on, on there. Anyone else? Okay, I just let me check really quick. Um, yeah, it doesn't look like we have any uh, questions uh, over email, but thank you guys so much. This was a really great presentation. Thank you. Thank you.